Welcome everyone and thank you for joining today's important AFSP town hall. The second in a town hall series on mental health and suicide prevention in communities of color. In June, we held our first session in the series focusing on mental health in the black community, honoring the black lives movement and speaking to the link between racial discrimination and mental health. Today, we are broadening the dialogue to focus on mental health for all communities of color. And the panelists and I will be discussing mental health disparities and solutions. And we really want to create a safe space where um, a, a supportive community, all of you and us, where we come together, leaning on the evidence, but also on our personal experiences and really authenticity in that way. We have a profound and yet correctable paradox though in our nation right now, whose root is racism. And so even while we are seeing major advances in biomedical science, for example, advances like a 70% decline in mortality from heart disease and stroke in recent decades, these advances are not being experienced equally across people groups. And in fact, the gap in many health outcomes is widening rather than narrowing. So outcomes across many different aspects of health from infant mortality to lifespan to mental health outcomes are markedly worse among people of color in the United States. And so we have a very odd disconnect between our, our scientific advances and technology and our actual living out of those advances for all people in our nation. So at AFSP, we condemn racism. We view ending these inequities as a health and actually a mental health imperative. We all must come together to uproot these layers of systemic racial inequities in our society, which our American society was actually built upon. So this takes effort and intentionality. At AFSP, our strategic plan has actually included um, a focus on preventing suicide in communities of color. And we're very excited to say that uh, one of the culminations of, of that priority has been that our scientific council recently made diversity a new priority area of our research grants program. And as the leading private funder of all suicide related research, um, this is a very important step that we are taking by making um, diverse communities, um, BIPOC, mental health and suicide prevention research a new priority. We are also actively partnering with organizations like the National Latino Behavioral Health Association, NALBA, and we have their uh, executive director joining us today, whom I'll introduce in a moment. Also with groups like the ACOMA Project, whose founder and president we have also joining with us, and I'll be introducing her, and other experts in the space in order to make mental health equity a national priority. So um, with that, let me uh, do some housekeeping. We will spend the first part of our session hearing from our panel of experts, and then we will open up and really want to hear from you all. We welcome your comments and questions, and I will try to get to as many of them to pose them to our panel of experts as we can and as we have time for. So please submit, submit those comments and questions online anytime during this first hour. Part of our um, so with that, let me now introduce our wonderful panel of experts. Um, I'm going to introduce each one and ask them to just say a few words about how they became interested in the areas of mental health and suicide prevention. So let's start with, um, oh, let me, let me change to, okay. Um, let me start with Dr. Michael Lindsay. We are so honored to have you, Dr. Lindsay. Dr. Lindsay is a noted scholar in the fields of child and adolescent mental health, as well as a leader in the areas of generational poverty and inequality. He is the executive director of the McSilver Institute for Poverty Policy and Research at New York University. 
and the Constant and Martin Silver Professor of Poverty Studies at NYU Silver School of Social Work. Um, and just a, a few other things from his extensive uh, resume. At the NYU McSilver Institute, Dr. Lindsay leads a team of researchers, clinicians, social workers, other professionals who are all committed to creating new knowledge about the root causes of poverty and developing solutions and evidence-based interventions to address its consequences, um, to rapidly translate that science into practice. And um, among their latest work, they have a three-year research grant from the NIMH studying the effectiveness of a novel treatment intervention for keeping Black adolescents engaged in depression treatment. And um, lastly, uh, at least that I have time to mention, very importantly, Dr. Lindsay leads the working group of experts supporting the Congressional Black Caucus Emergency Task Force on Black Youth Suicide and Mental Health. Um, and his group created the report, Ring the Alarm, the Crisis of Black Youth Suicide in America. So with that, Dr. Lindsay, uh, would you uh, kindly say hello and say a few words? Well, thank you for that wonderful introduction. And I thank my, my fellow panelists for uh, joining me in this conversation. Um, I just wanna say that I do this work and I've come to do this work because I know that it matters. I've lived this experience having grown up in Southeast Washington, DC. And anyone who is familiar with Washington, DC knows that Southeast is what they would uh, uh, sort of call the other side of the tracks. And so I saw a lot of things that sensitized me very early to a sort of social justice mandate um, in my life to uh, look at how to resolve these issues and to do so from a mental health perspective. Finally, I'll just say that, um, unfortunately in February of this year, I had a family member die by suicide mm -hmm. and it really crystallized the moment for me in that, again, as I started with this work uh, matters, uh, I know it matters and we have to uh, engage in efforts mm -hmm. to resolve those challenges so that folks can live a healthy life. Thank you so much for sharing that, Dr. Lindsay, and we're all terribly sorry for your family's loss. Um, let's uh, now introduce Dr. Alfie, um, whom I've had the pleasure of getting to know in these recent months. Dr. Alfie Breland Noble, uh, who is known as Dr. Alfie out in the world, is an internationally recognized scientist, author, and media personality. She has been focusing her work and her life's work on teens, college students, families, and communities of color. And she is recognized for an incredible ability to in, uh, inspire people out in communities by translating complex scientific concepts into digestible information and education and actionable strategies. She has a very extensive uh, media work that she's involved with, uh, thankfully to the benefit of the world. And she is also the founder and board president of the Acoma Project, uh, which was built on her uh, 20 plus years of research experience. Uh, so as a researcher working with those youth, teens, families, um, and, and studying the interventions uh, at the community and clinical level. So at the Acoma Project now, she and her team have built a research enterprise that is founded on that science of adolescent and community engagement. Um, she too, like Dr. Lindsay, has been very involved with the Congressional Black Caucus Working Group um, and forming and developing that incredible report, Ring the Alarm, uh, and she also has been involved with Congresswoman Bonnie Watson Coleman in some other policy areas, such as pursuing equity um, in Mental Health Act of 2019. Um, these are all very important and groundbreaking initiatives uh, in the policy world that can have, and we this part of the reason for today's session is actually to bring them to, um, to all of you today so that you, you can uh, digest them and uh, understand your role in advocating for the changes that are recommended in that report, as well as um, in these policy changes. Just one example, and I'll stop here, um, is that uh, recently Dr. Alfie moderated a celebrity panel 
with Ms. Taraji P. Henson, Charlemagne the God, and Mrs. Jennifer Lewis on racial disparities and addressing the mental health needs of African American youth. So we are very blessed to have you, Dr. Alfie. Um, please say hello to our, our audience today. Hello, everyone. Como esta acá? Uh, bonjour. My little bit of French and my little bit of Tagalog that I know. I feel like it's important. And of course, hola. But my Spanish is terrible. I always say me Espanol is tan mal, so I try not to even bother because I don't want to mangle it. But it really is important to me that AFSP and you, Dr. Moutier, have invited me to be here. I echo Dr. Lindsay um, to, to be here with Mr. Sandoval. I know we're supposed to call him Fred, but I just stand on principle. And I was raised, you call the people you respect by their title. So I, I'm sorry, I'll say Fred from now on, but I had to get that in. And so for me, it's really important to have this particular conversation because I always say that I want everybody to see themselves in this space of being able to do the work around suicide prevention and knowing that suicide does not discriminate. Um, suicidal ideation doesn't discriminate, right? Suicide completion doesn't discriminate, right? And one loss to suicide is one too many. So for me, it really is about um, having come in come into this work as a person who felt marginalized as a kid um, growing up in Virginia Beach, Virginia, and knowing what that marginalization feels like and knowing what isolation feels like. And so for me, it's really about what can I do on a day-to-day -day basis in any of the work I do to allow people who have once felt marginalized, who may currently feel marginalized, to know that I see you, that's important to me. People need to know that they're seen. None of us wants to be the invisible man like the famous book says. And so. How do we bring everybody in together? How do we help support people? And how do we like, really fight so that people know that suicide is not the option? I know it often feels like that for some of us, but we want really want people to know that there are people out here who care. So I haven't really talked about any of the other stuff I probably was supposed to, but I just really feel like it's important to say that you are seen, you are loved, you are valued. And part of us being here today is to communicate that message. Absolutely. Beautiful. Thank you, Dr. Alfie. And last but not least, I would love to introduce Mr. Fred Sandoval, um, our third panelist. So Fred has over 38 years of professional experience in health and human services. He serves currently as the executive director for the National Latino Behavioral Health Association. And under his leadership, NALBA, um, it's abbreviated, now operates uh, several important arms of the organization. Um, that includes the National Hispanic and Latino Addictions and Prevention Transfer Technology Centers, it's a mouthful, as well as a Strategic Prevention Framework, Partnerships for Success SAMHSA grant. So there is incredible work that is going on at NALBA all across America um, to help reach Latino populations and, and help equip both the mental health clinicians as well as the community. It's um, been such a pleasure getting to know you, Fred, and partnering uh, officially uh, between AFSP and NABA. Fred has served as a member of the SAMHSA Healthcare Reform Community of Practice, advising on effective outreach and enrollment of uninsured Latinos. He was appointed by Governor Bill Richardson as the Deputy Secretary of Health and Income Support division director for the state of New Mexico and was the alternate to the U.S.-Mexico Border Health Commission. Fred participated in President George W. Bush's announcement of the new Freedom Commission in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and served on the National Latino Mental Health Congress during the President Clinton administration. So I, again, I am just hitting highlights from each of these esteemed experts, um, incredible and extensive resumes. But that is, those are some of the highlights. Um, Fred, I would love it if you would also say hello to all of our participants on Facebook Live. Thanks, Christine. And, and, and yes, uh, uh, Dr. Lindsay and, and Dr. Alfie, it's great to be with you on this town hall because it's going to be an opportunity to have a powerful exchange about what we're all very passionate about and more importantly is uh, what we are about. Uh, my whole experience uh, has been really driven by uh, what it's like to grow up as a, a young Hispanic man in a rural state uh, and how that has shaped my worldview in ways that today I'm greatly indebted to my family and my ancestors for bringing to bear their, uh, their insights, our heritage, 
the values of why it's important to help and heal others. And uh, unbeknownst to me in my lifetime, I would experience two particular things that would really change the course of my uh, uh, professional tra trajectory. And that was um, uh, my sister was diagnosed with chronic paranoid schizophrenia and was discharged from the US Army as a result of her uh, medical condition. And not once in her whole lifetime was she ever referred to as a schizophrenic by her family. And not once did my mom ever say she had schizophrenia. We pretty much knew very early on that our family wasn't going to stigmatize our loved one in the way that the rest of the country would or the way the system of care would. So uh, that was a very powerful experience given you know, how she's had to live a very prolonged set of circumstances regarding that illness. My best friend in high school committed suicide. And I remember that event as if it happened yesterday. And uh, the week before he shot himself, he showed me the, a pistol and I didn't think much of it at the time, but it became evident that uh, something had changed in his life and it not only changed his life, it changed mine. Uh, and I've been in mental health for most of my career. So uh, I'm excited to be here today. There's just so much to say. I probably want to end quickly here because uh, all I could say is this synergy of uh, experts and experience that's here that Christine, you're going to help moderate is going to really help to really reinforce the things that we do well and the challenges before us. So I'm really excited. So um, I know you want to get us rocking here. So. Yes, I do. Thank you so much, Fred, um, and each of you for sharing just a bit from your personal lives that will help help all of us to um, understand, you know, we all have stories. We're all passionate about this work for a variety of different reasons, and we're, we're connected in those human ways. So thank you. Let's start our uh, the meat of our discussion off by really just focusing on a very basic and foundational concept of mental health disparities. And uh, Dr. Alfie, I'd like to start with you because um, I, I've heard you speak about this and drawing on your work with youth and families, your research, and also in your book on mental health engagement in uh, diverse populations. Just can you help us by sharing how you frame the concept and the issues around mental health disparities? Absolutely. So uh, like Dr. Lindsay, we essentially study very much the same thing in a lot of ways. And so, you know, I've heard him talk about these things too. So I always feel like it's important to acknowledge, you know, the people at the table in the room who've been in the fight with you for a long time. And there was a considerable amount of time in both of our careers when this conversation was not something that we wanted to talk about, right? It was like, oh no, you know, the Black folks and Latinx folks and Asian Americans and other folks, you know, there's, there's really not any difference in terms of what they experience versus anybody else. And that's not true. Um, and so what we know, the literature, when I started, the literature really told us that there were not statistically significant differences. Of course, it's clinically significant. Of course, it's significant to us as individuals. But statistically speaking, there were not differences in terms of prevalence. I'm speaking of children and adolescents. We used to say that about depression and anxiety. Actually, what we have learned now in recent years, I was looking at a 2018 study just yesterday, trying to write up some materials. And what we've seen is that the trend is that for African-Americans specifically, um, there is a rise, a faster rise in the prevalence rate of depression specifically for African-American young people um, than for whites and Latinx population. Now that's a study, right? So you look at five studies, you're probably gonna see five different things. So what I mean to say is that we know that um, everybody across all racial ethnic groups, especially when we look at kids, they're all struggling with something, right? So you have large, a large proportion of kids, about 30%, 25 to 30% who are struggling with anxiety disorders or who are dealing with anxiety disorders. It's about eight to 15% who are dealing with depression, depressive illness. Um, and then you have all these things, all these kids that are impacted by trauma. Right, and so trauma in and of itself is not a mental illness, but the impacts of trauma exposure are what we want to treat. That's where the disparities come in. The disparities come in in terms of who's care. So what I always want to say to people is, you would think that if African Americans and Latinx populations represent roughly 27, 26 percent of the population, they should represent that proportion of people who are getting good quality care. 
that's, you know, that's where you find disparities. They're not. And so what we find that in terms of this area of disparities, people are not getting across the board high quality care. We talk about something called the evidence base, and I'll be quick. My question is always, and a lot of us, our question is evidence for whom and under what circumstances, right? So those are some of the disparities. I've heard my colleague Fred talk about class standards, or we talk about cultural and linguistic competence. Not everybody has those, no, not everybody meets that criteria. And so what are people getting when they come into the clinical setting? They're not necessarily going to engage somebody who speaks their first language. They're not necessarily going to engage somebody who understands their individual history and experiences. And so all of that negatively impacts care. So in terms of disparities, what we're really looking at is the quality of care I believe that people get, the length of time they stay in, to, in care, and who actually gets in care in the first place. Um, so that's what I would say about disparities. And that's what we're trying to eradicate. We want everybody to have care, good quality care. Thank you so much, Dr. Alfie. Um, you laid it out beautifully. And like you said, the truth is that this data is not new. You know, so shame on us in this country that the IOM, the National Academy of Sciences now, put out that report in 2002, calling out these vast differences in health outcomes, including in the mental health arena, that are racially and geographically driven differences. Um, and, and we, this is a call to action. We have to figure out how to do better and where do we start? So um, Dr. Lindsay, let me turn to you and um, please chime in on this topic of health and mental health disparities. I've heard you speak about um, the issues of many things, poverty, uh, inequality, racial discrimination, and some of these social determinants. And, and I've also heard you speak to the issue of the school to prison pipeline. And I, I just would love to hear you um, kind of just chew on this about the impact of uh, racism and all of these factors on mental health. Sure, let me just start off by uh, sharing a quick anecdote. And those who have heard me talk uh, about this issue in various settings. I've probably heard this before, so um, I beg your indulgence in terms of listening again to it. But I, I once interviewed a 15-year-old um, a Black uh, adolescent boy who was extremely depressed. And I asked him, um, when, when you're sad and down, um, you know, in a depressed mood, what do you do about it? And his response to me shocked me. He said, very clearly and matter of factly, I want to go and knock somebody's head off because I want them to feel the same pain that I feel. And so then I began to problem solve with him about, well, what happens then once you do that? And, uh, and the reality is that if he does that in schools or in the community, wherever he is, it's going to uh, lead to a punitive response, right? Um, in school, he's going to be expelled or disciplined. Uh, in the community, he might be arrested. In fact, he might be arrested in school as well. Um, and so what we've been saying for years, uh, Dr. Alfie and, and others uh, have been saying uh, for years is that for Black youth, their symptom expression might be more nuanced than we uh, would imagine, um, that we are likely to see when they're depressed, more irritability, uh, more angry and explosive responses. Um, and rarely do we see the underlying feature that precipitates it all, which is depression. And so uh, what happens then in a generalized way in schools is that, and, and voluminous studies have documented this, that black and brown kids are um, over suspended and expelled from schools in large part because of implicit biases. Oftentimes it is also the case that in communities of color, there is no school mental health professional in the building to offer any kind of behavioral health supports for kids. And so the response is then to quote unquote correct behaviors is to uh, have an orientation toward discipline and punitive responding. And so one of the issues that uh, we talked about in um, the report that we submitted to the Congressional Black Caucus is that we need more mental health professionals in schools proportionate to the number of 
uh, school uh, kids in that school. Uh, oftentimes we hear that there's only one provider uh, in a school one day of the week. And so if the provider's there on Tuesday, what about Thursday, Friday, Monday, and Wednesday, right? Like, and so um, we need more professionals in schools proportion to the number of kids in schools. And so this, this notion of a, a school to prison pipeline is such that when behavioral problems or issues are not seen from a mental health and supportive perspective, kids are often expelled and suspended from school. That begins a vicious cycle because when they're suspended and away from the schools, the question begs, are they receiving the requisite supports and services that they need? And the answer is no. And so um, this perpetual cycle then leads them in and out of schools uh, when they're wayward and not engaged in any positive ways. They're likely to uh, engage in behaviors that um, uh, require, unfortunately, a response by law enforcement and they go into juvenile detention centers. And I'll just end with this. Studies have shown that upwards of either 75 or 80% of kids in juvenile detention centers actually have diagnosable mental health issues that were not treated in a school setting. Incredible and, and so true. And yet when your boots on the ground in those places, it's, it is the, the assumptions that are being made about these behaviors are, if, if those in charge do not have a background either in trauma-informed care or trauma-informed educational approaches um, or the education in all of these disparities that we're discussing now, they will look like a, a hammer is the one size fits all kind of tool. And yet here we are today. It, is not, it has not gotten us where we need to go. Um, so thank you for sharing that. Fred, you have uh, this experience from, the, from over many years and from the national level of being a leader in Latino mental health and working in systems of, for change, policy as well as um, health and human systems. And so I'd love for you to share your perspective on mental health disparities and, and maybe some ideas around solutions as well, since you've been at that system level. Yeah, thanks, Christina. You know, I'm, I'm thinking right now, just in terms of my lifetime, uh, just to give a context to my response, because uh, there are uh, a lot of variables that account for why the system of care looks like today. Uh, because you think about how the U.S. compares globally to other countries who also struggle with mental illnesses, right? Um, given how all these illnesses transcend race and geographical boundaries, the American experience is, is very telling. And so I'm going to kind of speak to it in terms of what I've observed in my own life, my own lifetime. Uh, the community mental health system itself really almost from the onset was bifurcated and put into just a different track altogether. And the end result is it started to separate. And in my mind, I've said it also started to stigmatize differences between the healthcare delivery system and the mental health system. So from its onset, it was almost designed in such a way that it was gonna create even more problems than, that one, than were, they were supposed to fix. Yeah. And the issues with that is the construct of the design for the healthcare delivery system today has just been this composite of experiments, composites of incremental policy making. And simply, as I always describe it, uh, I use this analogy all the time, especially in light of the fact that what we're really asking communities to do is to try to respond to mental health issues, disorders, and conditions in ways that they're not adequately resourced to do. And I've always used the analogy, we have this huge forest fire and we're given the resources of a volunteer fire department. So somehow we're expected to magically help solve these issues. And, and, and we have this crisis all around us. We didn't design those systems, but what we know about those systems is just as they were built, they can be rebuilt. And so while the mental health systems themselves have resulted in some of the things that my colleagues have just talked about, the 
uh, the, the pipeline into prisons, for instance, and the lack of adequate treatment. What we simply know in the United States then and today is that racial and ethnic minorities continue to far, are fare far worse than our white counterparts. And so that's very well documented. In fact, it's so well documented that what's happened now is that it's almost report, research, and study after study keeps telling us that. So while those research studies keep doing that, here's where we are today, is we really have incredibly poor outcomes. And so the disparities we're now experiencing, they've actually continued to rise in the United States. Uh, so we're in our own individual leadership roles cognizant of that. And fortunately, we're all playing a role to, to help mitigate those things. There are some systemic and policy issues we can speak to in just a second. But you know, in terms of the Latino population, clearly what's happened is our disparities are so severe and, for, and increasingly persistent that what's happening is that um, we have less and less access to care now uh, for mental health services. And so the end result is our, conditioning, our, our conditions are worsening. And it particularly worsens for individuals uh, who have migrated here. So what happens is the longer you stay in the US, the poorer your health outcomes are and your poorer your mental health outcomes. So you have this, this challenge of how do you manage a population that is growing in ways that are just, un just unimaginable, right? I remember the Surgeon General's report on race and culture. It was an important document to the work we did with the Latino Mental Health Congress in the year 2000. So that was 20 years ago. And I reread it and I said, oh my God, you could just you could say the same thing today, you just have to up the numbers. And I thought to myself, so things not only are the same, they've gotten worse, right? And I'll share some uh, examples here in just a second. But having said all of that, there are kind of a whole cadre of uh, disparate conditions that Latinos face that are unique to that population. And, and I'll, I'll touch on them just enough to ba basically recognize that what's happening is the data tells us the story. Uh, what the data doesn't tell us is, uh, what is it that works uh, because it's telling us the things that aren't working right and i want to pay a little attention to that because the hope in all of this is that you know we fight the good fight largely because what we're trying to do is improve our health status right uh and i think the opportunities that, that are before us are immense the question is what is it going to take to do that not just leadership but there are particular things that are low-hanging fruits that really speak to why we are challenged to be able to resource the work we have to do a research level at a program level uh, in ways that communities can be better resourced. But part of what's happened is I can recall the work that was done by Senator Pete Domenici. Uh, and he did this over a 30 year career, by the way. Uh, and I speak very fondly and kindly of him because he led the charge. His daughter also suffered from schizophrenia. So we had conversations about what we had in common as family members, but what we had in common was this policy issue. He worked very diligently to developing the mental health and addictions parity laws uh, that are in place today. Uh, I can remember precisely three months before he retired, he says, Fred, I've never made a political promise, but I'm going to make one today. And he said, we're going to pass parity this year. And in November, parity was passed. And, and while the law and the policy is significant, what's happened is its implementation and enforcement leaves a lot to be desired. So when my colleagues talk about all that still needs to be done, the resources that we still need today are still void and absent. And here's where I think the less rest the opportunity. It's a new opportunity to strengthen the policy to be able to ensure that every state is ensuring that mental health is treated equitably to the healthcare mm. issues in our country. And if we never do that, what happened in the 1960s to create that bifurcation will never remedy the absence of an effective healthcare delivery system in this country so we can be globally competitive as all of our other uh, sister countries across the, uh, the world are. There's are some countries that are doing incredible work. We're actually learning from other countries. And it's because they made the policy decision to ensure that health equity is a reality, not just a dream. And we deserve that because the people that are suffering because of the absence of effective policy tells us there are things we could be doing right now that if they're effectively enforced, like the class standards, I, we, all I can say is we have tools here. We need the leadership and the enforcement 
to implement those effectively because if we don't then we're just going to keep incrementally adding other pieces and we're not going to be able to staff that volunteer fire department with the resources that are needed in every community in every state in this country so i hope that as we start to talk about other disparities that we can kind of highlight what we're doing to actually address those issues and i'll have some examples in a little bit so I just wanted to echo one thing. We talk about disparities in terms of those of us, and I say everybody's a patient at some point in some way, shape or fashion. So I don't, other people won't look at patient as a pejorative term, it's not, right? We're all patients at some point. And so one thing I wanna talk about outside of patients is research. And Dr. Lindsay knows I'm gonna say this. So there are also disparities in who is leading the research in this country. If you have people of color who cannot get access to tax funded money, tax funded, right? We all pay taxes to lead the studies, right? What are we gonna study? We're gonna study things that are close to home for us. So that means we're gonna work with people who look like us. We're gonna engage people who share some of our cultural background, or we have the empathy to work across difference, right? So I may wanna, as a black woman, wanna work with queer and LGBTQ folks who are also of color, right? Because that's my passion, right? So the idea that there, we still struggle as principal investigators, as people who lead research, that's been my passion for forever. It shouldn't be that 2% of funded principal sole investigators from NIMH, who we'll call the thing, are Black. It shouldn't be 2%. It should be 13%, reflecting the population, or for Latinos, or for other Asian Americans, or for other folks. And so I just feel like it's really important to add that piece in about there are also disparities in terms of how we generate knowledge. That's critical. We that's something we can fix, and we have to fix that. Amen. And that that is exactly why um, we've made that decision as an organization to prioritize diversity, and that includes both the topic of the research right. as well as the backgrounds of the researchers. Right. And because you're spot on in the way that you explained, we only do what we know to do, right. and so we right. have to diversify the field. Um, and that is something that we also would advocate for at the federal level, 100%. Um, I mean, Fred, I'm, I'm thinking also about some of the things that you shared with us so eloquently about rebuilding a system that is broken right now on so many levels, especially I'm thinking of the healthcare system. I once heard um, a, a large health system leader say jokingly, but, but sort of hauntingly true, that you know, health systems were never built with patients in mind. Mm -hmm. And so there's that. And now then think about built with mental health in mind. And now we layer built with communities of color and people of color from diverse backgrounds and cultural needs um, in mind. And so the, I, I think that underscores the rebuild necessity instead of the the add-on and the pile-on and the band-aid fix. And, and you moved very quickly from there to talking about policy solutions in order to appropriately fund and do that kind of restructuring um, that we need so desperately in our health system. Yeah, thank you for uh, framing it that way because it, it really speaks to something that um, the US is very uncertain about doing as a nation. Uh, it's interesting that we talk about trying to ensure that we protect the health, welfare, and safety of, of, of our residents, our citizens, the people that live here. And then we do a, a relatively um, good job in some areas and then a relatively poor job in others. Uh, and where we particularly have struggled with that is, is in our healthcare system. So the end result has been is that when you privatize and, and create a for-profit opportunity to to incentivize making um, really uh, profits from the industry. Uh, and it doesn't really relate to the outcomes because what ends up happening, it doesn't relate to the outcomes in this way, is if it was actually incentivized to ensure people had great outcomes, that would be one thing, but it's not, right? So what you do is you have disparate conditions that persist because it's not about in incentivizing the provider system, the payment mechanisms and the financing and the, uh, those aspects of it, but the patient is the one who's actually receiving the poor care, if they receive care at all. And in fact, if they even have coverage of any sort. So you have compounded the situation 
where the patient isn't first. You know, the tension in the medical field, of course, is that you know, the patient does come first, right? Well, uh, that's the that's the conflict. That's the duality in our system. The system is, in fact, really doing the opposite. It's incentivizing how it is that we can actually ignore uh, profit from the system. And so I would simply say is that if we really in the U.S. would ever attempt to reform the system, I think the opportunities uh, are have to come sooner rather than later because the disparate conditions we're facing right now are uh, causing a high number of deaths. And it well, tells um, me... I'm sorry, I, 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 I just wanted to add real quick uh, to uh, your eloquent points, Fred, that we do have a mental health treatment system in this country, and particularly for black and brown people, it's called mass incarceration. Yeah, so when we use those penal systems to provide that care, and that's in some measures by design, right? It, it tells us that the advocacy now has to raise to a different level. Uh, and I think the opportunity to address those, those particular issues uh, really need to be presented as a priority. Just as you said, Christine, is how do we raise these issues as priorities? And if we do that as a nation, I think the leadership opportunity before us is going to allow us to start to bring forward really super bold reform activities because otherwise uh, Latinos are going to start to continue to see and experience things such as uh, higher rates of suicide for Latina teens because what ends up happening is this their set of circumstances is different than it was 20 years ago where we had low relatively low suicide attempts and and completions today it's just the opposite things are getting worse, not better. And so the optimism for all of us is then, what are we doing that actually helps to address those things? There's things at the community and program level that we can do, and then try to still concurrently work nationally to address these big gaps in financing and equitable access to resources for improving people's health outcomes. And I know both of you, Dr. Alfie and Dr. Lindsay, you're, you got things to say about, about this in terms of what, what can be done at the family and community level, given these concerning trends, both in terms of what Fred is referring to about Latina adolescents um, and suicide attempt behaviors, and also Dr. Lindsay and Dr. Alfie, what you and your research has, has clearly pointed out of the incredibly concerning trends among Black youth as well in terms of mm -hmm. suicidal behavior. Go ahead, Dr. Lindsay. No, absolutely. Um, so we um, completed a study that came out last November um, looking at um, suicide trends from 1991 to 2017 uh, using the uh, Youth Risk Behavior Survey uh, and did find that over that span of time, when you look at suicide attempts as just one indices or indication of suicide behavior, um, that Black youth actually saw a 73% increase over that span of time, while um, other ethnic and racial groups actually saw a decrease mm. in suicide attempts. And then for having an injury uh, related to a suicide attempt that led to uh, or required hospitalization, Black adolescent boys saw a 122% increase mm. over that span of time. No other group actually experienced a, uh, an increase of that magnitude. Uh, and what we also know from other studies um, is that from uh, 2010 through 2017, for example, um, uh, black adolescent boys saw a 60% increase in terms of death by uh, suicide and uh, black adolescent girls actually saw 182% increase in terms of death by suicide over that span of time. So all of that led us, Dr. Alfie and other of our colleagues, um, you know, both on the research side, uh, mm -hmm. community members, adv advocates, uh, to uh, to frame and to address these issues and to ring the alarm. You know, we we framed it. It's this is a ring the alarm moment, um, and unfortunately, there is, as you mentioned uh, in the uh, in the introductions for us, there is uh, legislation um, currently, uh, you know, sort of being led by. Congresswoman Bonnie Watson Coleman and other members. Now there's a, a Senate version of uh, the, the the parity, uh, increasing parity in mental health uh, related to uh, the circumstances and outcomes that 
our, our youth of color are finding themselves in. Uh, it's, it's really, really a ring the alarm moment and uh, we're working hard to bring forth legislation to do something about it. Yeah, so echoing my colleagues, both of them, um, I think that there are solutions out there. So as I talked about earlier, there's evidence-based practice. There's also this thing called practice-based evidence. So every time Fred speaks, he's taken back to my postdoc days at Duke when I was a mental health services research postdoc, right? So everything in your system of care, that's all we talked about. Um, but there are lots of things out there that community-based organizations, that individual communities, that parents and families, right? And it's not, of course, it's not perfect, right? Because the research that Dr. Um, that Fred talked about earlier, might as well be doctor, that Fred talked about earlier, all that knowledge. Um, I remember Dr. Luis Zayas um, years ago talking about Latinas and, you know, what the issues were around suicide. He was the person who I looked to because I knew he was going to bring it talking about that specific population. And, and as my colleague, Dr. Lindsay said, bringing them back then, so we need to do something about this. And so I just think about people like him and Dr. Guillermo Bernal, who's a mentor to me and the work that they have always been doing, really pushing these issues to the forefront. And then I think about the work of Dr. Lindsay and some of my other colleagues. I'm just thinking of people from my generation, like Dr. Sean Joe, right? Who've been out here talking about, here are things that we need, you know, and some of it is, Surveillance. I've heard Dr. Moutier, I've heard you talk about that. Like what are the surveillance systems that we have available and how adequately and accurately are they capturing these racial disparities and racial differences? I'm just thinking of people who shared these things because I want people to know who's out there doing this work. There's folks out here putting in work. Uh, Dr. Donna Barnes talks about surveillance a lot. And so for me, it's really about there are people out here we can look to who already have some ideas for us. We should look to those people. Right, echoing what Fred said, yeah, we need more studies. We also need to look at what exists. So for me, you know, you mentioned my book, which I'm so excited about because I don't remember the name of it, Community Mental Health Engagement with Diverse Population, right? It is about exactly what you talked about. These are solutions. So we talk about Latinx populations in California where they're academic researchers at the University of California, San Francisco, and community, recently immigrated community members who are trying to work on um, his name is uh, Dr. Martinez. He's an assistant professor at UCSF. They're working on mental health in the pediatric population, right? Collaboratively, I think about colleagues in New Jersey who are working on um, uh, women, pregnant women, men, Latinas, mental health. We, some of our work is in this book and we work on how do you collaborate with black faith communities. So there's so many people out here mm -hmm. working on this practice-based evidence, both in terms of how do you generate knowledge and in terms of how do you take care of kids? There's this brother here in the DC area named Dr. Bruce Purnell. I don't know that he's, he's a clinical psychologist. I don't know if his Love More movement is sort of out front as a mental health intervention, but it certainly has those features, right? Because it's mentoring, it's teaching these kids how to resolve things with love. And then finally, what I'll say is, another person that makes me think of is Dr. Howard Stevenson, right? And what he does with boys, right? Mentoring boys through sports. So there are a lot, there's evidence out there we just have to be willing to go pull in. I always say this, there are multiple ways of knowing. There's not just one way. It's not just a randomized control trial. That's not the only way we can gain new knowledge. So there's mixed methods, there's qualitative, there's this practice-based evidence. Um, and all of those are ways that we can use that are culturally relevant, that are rooted in community and that resonate with people, which it does what? It increases uptake because it's already familiar to folks. Yeah, spot on. In fact, I would say the community is, are trying to fill in the gaps. Yes. Uh, they're actually doing the work. Uh, our agency some years back did some uh, research work called Community Defined Evidence. Is the work of, in the communities was defining their work because of what worked in their communities. We helped to gather the evidence about why it was that that was working and the absence of evaluation dollars, right? So, the larger grants went to organizations that had the capacity and the experience and all the expertise and then the communities are left to their own devices but they're doing some incredible work right uh and uh, and we developed an inventory of some of those examples right and you're absolutely right i think communities are they're filling in those gaps they're going to take mm -hmm. care of their own they're going to take care of their mm -hmm. families and we have to support and bolster that because that safety net is working for them we have to learn from our communities. And if we don't, it's like, duh, 
Um, but I would simply say, just if I can end with this, I'll keep it really short. There are three programs that we are associated with that really are, are impactful. Uh, and one of them happens to be an evidence-based practice called Natural Helpers. Mm -hmm. It's a peer-driven, youth-guided program that helps train youth on how to identify amongst their peers the warning signals for suicide. And then they get to work with their peers because I can assure you that peers know exactly what's happening with their colleagues in school settings, middle schools and high schools. Well, this program had some and powerful outcomes and it was developed in a rural community. And the reason why is because they had a spike in suicide uh, completions. And they said, we wanna do something about it developed from the community and now it's an evidence-based practice so they took the long route but it's an example uh, that i think i just want to highlight because there are other models to look at familia adelante which is a life skills program it looks at the underlying stressors that latinos communities are experiencing they have multiple stressors right it addresses those issues and then we have one called promotores de bienestar we're looking at the well the factors of what we do well that helps to take care of us in the absence of having other interventions and models available to us because we realize we're doing some things we just need to do more of and to support families particularly parents grandparents and other uh, helpers so i think the opportunity is abound if we can support communities to do that we have a number of comments and questions coming in um so let me get to some of them but but many of them are along these lines people are asking how do we get involved how do i be more involved to uh in this movement to create the changes that we're talking about um beyond you know walking in afsps out of the darkness walks and things that are more um, the, that, that people are, uh, seem to know more about. This is coming from an AFSP network in particular. Um, so let, maybe what, what I should do is get into some of the specific questions because some of them get to these issues of like the role of everyday people and uh, what can be done. There's a very, um, really, I think, important question uh, for Dr. Lindsay um, from someone named Steve who says he, he's, he's taking what you said about the, um, the issue in school, in schools, and especially for students of color, that behavioral and mental health distress can be treated as a discipline, disciplinary issue. Mm -hmm. And uh, are there examples of policies out there that can, can handle this differently, that can successfully serve these students in a better way? Yeah, I'll give a quick anecdote. Uh, I was just talking to a vice principal at a school um, just uh, yesterday, in fact, yesterday. Um, and he talked about the importance of mental health professionals being in the school. He advocated for that, uh, assigned by his principal to ensure that emotional and social supports were available for, for students. He told me that the graduation rate, just by bringing in uh, mental health professionals in the school, proportionate to the number of kids in the school went from 67% to 89%, just like that in a year, just by offering mental health supports. And so from a policy perspective, and particularly in light of COVID, everyone is talking about what is gonna happen with kids who are returning to schools in the fall who are going to be highly traumatized, grieving related to uh, COVID and its consequences. And so if any jurisdiction throughout this country is not thinking about mental health supports for their children uh, in terms of their return to school and, and really supporting them, they are setting those kids up to fail. So that is a, a, a main policy imperative that I think is hugely important in this contemporary context. I just love the way you're framing this so much because oftentimes the way it feels for us as parents when we ask those questions about mental health resources and services is you feel like you're 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 calling out something very extraneous very peripheral to the academic um, and and you know the main thrust of the school's job and the truth is exactly as you say without that social emotional psychological and mental health support students cannot thrive. And in particular, with regard to these differences that may be there in terms of the, the misinterpretation of 
distrust behaviors for certain student groups more so than others? That's I right. think we also, I come from a family of educators. And so I think, you know, we used to have these conversations all the time about how black and brown children were punished for engaging in the same behaviors that white children were not, right? So you get a hug and, oh, baby, let's figure out what's wrong. The black kid go to the principal's office. The Latinx kid go to the principal's office. It even happened in my own family with my brother, a younger brother, who's a big dude. And so some of it is the anti-bias training, right? We got to teach the people, and I'm saying this as a child of educators, we got to teach the people who are in the schools working with our kids, right? The implicit bias, anti-racist training at a foundational level, you have to be able to stop, take a beat, and when that kid is angry, look at all those children equally when their only thing they're doing is demonstrating anger. Maybe underneath that anger, as both my colleagues have said, is a mental health concern, is psychological distress. If all you see is the anger, then we're going to end up with the same stuff we've been ended up with, kids going in disparate directions just because of how we as adults perceive the same behavior. It's not because of what the kids are doing. It's what we see. So yeah. th th those pieces as well, I also think we have to talk about mental health literacy. I'm not meaning it, that's the language that we use. I'm not meaning to call people ignorant. It is literally about how do you recognize, and mental health first aid is a part of it. I think there's more to it. You gotta have a cultural adaptation, dare I say the word, right? That allows people from different racial ethnic groups to see themselves centered in the conversation around mental health. If you don't have that, I think we end up with the same stuff we've had going so you know before now. Can I have one more quick point um, that is incredibly important and builds on what uh, what we've been talking about. So a colleague of mine, uh, Lisa Genetian, um, did a study and found that there was an uptick in behavioral problems in these black and brown schools at the end of the month. And then when she did further investigation, she found out that these kids who are being um, referred to the school office for discipline problems actually had, uh, were living in families that ran out of food stamps. Oh, So we can increase and extend food stamp benefits, SNAP benefits for families. Right, right. right. Okay, I, w I have to get to one question in particular because it's from a, a very special and remarkable uh, person in our AFSP network named Corbin Stanley. And he um, is asking you all, he is a researcher himself and he is an incredible advocate. For those of us who are researchers, how can we make sure research is properly translated into equitable and effective policy change? That's a biggie. Okay, look, yes, it is a biggie, but that you know, that's my life. I've been arguing this stuff for feel like a hundred years, nobody listens. So I'm glad that somebody asked the question. So part of it is you have we have garbage in, garbage out. We're all taught that as researchers. So if you start from a foundation that does not include the diverse representation of the people you want to impact change for, I'm not sure you make the argument because if it comes, I'm sorry to get heated, but if it comes in front of me and I don't see some Latinos, some black folks, some Asians, some Native, I'm gonna be like, what you want me to do with this, right? So you don't translate after the fact. This is not to you. Professor Corbin, this is to all of us. You start from the foundation and make sure you have that representation included. Then when you come up to the Hill and you're sitting in front of a Congresswoman Bonnie Watson Coleman, or you're sitting in front of an Ilhan Omar and they start peppering you with questions about, well, what does this have to do with my community? My constituents back in New Jersey or my constituents back in Minnesota, you already have an answer. And I think that's a part of it. We have to be able to articulate what, how what we're doing is, is beneficial for the widest range of people possible. If we can't cross that hurdle, I'm not sure that there's much we're going to be able to say that's going to convince a policymaker they should care. The second thing is you got to give people sound bites. They don't like all that gobbledygook that we like, right? So they don't want to hear about the area under the curb. They don't want to hear about, you know, what's your, I don't know, what's your p-value. They don't care about all that. What they care about is give me an outcome. Tell me what's the outcome. And I'm saying this because Dr. Lindsay and I have been writing this stuff up for people. And so you know what the bullet, the talking points need to be. And then I think they need solutions. So just like he just said, to me, that crystallizes. We need to extend SNAP benefits, right? That's social determinants of health. We got the technical researchery language for it, SDO8. But for that congresswoman or congressman or senator, we have to say that we can, if we extend these benefits, here's the result that you're going to get that's going to be positive. People, you, so you got to translate it for them. But my biggie is if you start with a limited sample, 
please don't put it in front of me because I'm going to tell you, you need to take it back because that has nothing to do with people I know and who look like me. And so I'm not going to want to hear it. So you've got to start there. That's just my two cents. Uh, unbelievably, we are at the top of the hour and I want oh, to give no. each of you, I know it, um, a, a moment to just uh, say anything else that's on your mind that you haven't been able to say and um, really to send our, our audience members out with, uh, with some, some words of encouragement before we close. So um, Fred, why don't we start with you? Well, thanks, Christine and, and Dr. Lindsay and Dr. Alfie. Well, what a delight it's been to have this exchange. I could just imagine in a face-to-face -face exchange if we were to be unbottled and uh, <laughs> let loose with uh, our passion, uh, the things we would change in an instant, right? If we, we go to the if, hill together. That's what well, all I could yes. say is uh, uh, there's work to be done, as they say. But uh, thank you for uh, the opportunity to kind of make some closing comments. Uh, I'll say something in Spanish and then I'm going to translate it into English. It's very short. La esperanza es la última para morir. Hope is the last to die. Uh, and so we have lots of hope. Uh, it's one thing we have a lot of. And the reason why is our resiliency to overcome all these barriers and challenges and disparities has strengthened us. Uh, so our resolve is to make things better. Uh, and for uh, the communities that are listening into this Facebook uh, presentation today, there are some things we can be hopeful for. COVID is helping us change the system because the system can't control COVID. And there are things that are happening today that we need to pay close attention to. Um, you know, the use of telephonic devices Right, and so uh, Latinos use these devices pretty extensively because moms like to talk to their kids and they like to text them and so does the grandma, right? Uh, so that means the grandpas are starting to use uh, technology, right? Um, all of that's a positive message because while in the past, maybe that wasn't as strong a tool, it is becoming a very powerful tool for Latinos, right? Because the younger generation is teaching the elders, this is how it works. And then when it works, guess what we're doing? We continue to strengthen our bonds using methodologies that before we historically wouldn't have used. And there's been some studies that actually have shown that it's actually helping uh, parents particularly reduce their worry about what's happening with their families. That, mo that instantaneous connection there uh, is critical because the thing about the worry, it's actually the number one thing that's impacting uh, all of us in this country about COVID is people are prolifically worried and they're worried in all the things that are already layered on top of the things that we know about being anxious, depressed, sad, uh, not sleeping, their state of loneliness, uh, isolation, all of that. But what sits on top of that is people's worry. So what we have before us is the opportunity to keep building our connections, strengthening those bonds because the protective factors within communities of color are very powerful. Uh, there's nothing that science is gonna take away from us. There isn't anything in policy is gonna take away from us. What we need to do is build on our assets, our protective factors, because the list of what those are, because they work for us, we need to continue to do more of that, reinforce it so that when we can start to research it and then move it from research to practice, it's because we know it works. And the reason it works is because uh, communities of color are very hopeful and they live that experience every single day. So I just want to say is in all of this exchange today, yeah, there are disparities, but boy, the hope in this is powerful. And let's, let's build that. Let's build that together. Thank you, Fred. That is awesome. Uh, Dr. Lindsay, let's go to you next. Yeah, now I'll try to uh, keep this really brief, but um, I, I recently ran across an article from the Archives of General Psychiatry from the year 1969. And the author of the article basically was calling out the fact that uh, suicide was an issue in the Black community that was being ignored. And he framed it as um, the, uh, this finding that between the ages of 20 and 35 years old that black uh, men in an urban setting were twice as likely to die by suicide as their white counterparts. Mm -hmm. And so um, this is not a new issue. Uh, it's one that we've turned uh, um, 
our attention away from for whatever reasons. Um, it's an issue that um, we've uh, highlighted in our research. And, um, you know, I do feel, uh, as I've said earlier, and Alfie will agree with this, Dr. Alfie will agree with this, this is a ring the alarm moment. And we have to keep our foot on the pedal, um, you know, in terms of the gas pedal on this car that's moving along. We have to continue to fight, 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 because every inch of our fight has the potential to save a life. Thank you so much. Dr. Alfie. Uh, not much, just but I want to try, for me, I always like to try to bring myself up. One of my friends taught me that her son died by suicide probably about 20 years ago. And she and I are good partners, Kathy Williams. And Kathy always talks about bring you up at the end so that you're not leaving on a low note. And so what I want to say is something I always say, and I really do mean this. So anybody who's watching, anybody who sees this later, whatever we're going to do with the video, I want to wish you lots of love, lots of light. And I want it always, this is my thing, to be informed by good, culturally relevant science. So that's what I want to say. Mm -hmm. Excellent, excellent. Wow. Thank you so much. Um, okay, so let me just close us out. Um, we really hope that everyone who has joined us today is coming away with some new and deeper knowledge, but even more importantly, a sense of solidarity, of safety and healing, no matter where you are in your journey, you are not alone. We see you, we hear you, we are with you. Today, we have heard a framework for how to better understand some of the aspects of structural racism and how they relate and have led to mental health disparities and how health systems must change um, to not only become more patient-centered, more mental health savvy, but to be designed with people of color in mind and um, at the community level as well. And never forget that no matter who you are, your connections to other people, your love, support, and encouraging words are a huge safety net and protective factor for all of us, for all of our mental health um, yeah. and for suicide prevention. Um, I wanna highlight a mantra that I've heard all of you share, nothing for us without us. And we at AFSP are dedicated to this and to continuing to elevate this dialogue and doing the work with you. So I really want to thank um, and close our session out by thanking our esteemed incredible panelists, Dr. Alfie Breland Noble, Dr. Michael Lindsay and Mr. Fred Sandoval for shining a light on these issues that lead to mental health disparities and sharing their solutions to improve mental health in communities of color. So thank you so much. And we hope to have all of you join us at our next town hall in the series of Elevating Voices for Long Lasting Change. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you. See you all, good to see you. Great conversation, everybody. Thank you oh, so much for your- Yes. Thank your, you. Your, Fred, uh, you was making me over here. I wanted to cry. Like Fred was making me want to cry. I was like, oh my God, Fred's amazing. <laughs> I want to be Fred's best friend.